He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's the final verse in the book of Acts. If this was a television series, here's where the cameras would pan out and Morgan Freeman's voice would be reading that scripture as the credits begin to roll. There are other translations that use the single word unhindered. That's the word that the book of Acts ends with. Is that a joke? Because contextually, at this moment in the life of the church, the church is looking very, very hindered. I mean, Paul is living under house arrest, a long, corrupt legal nightmare, interrupted a revival, and that's where it landed him. Now, I've heard plenty of sermons on the book of Acts. that It's loaded with dream passages for preachers, but basically no one preaches from the last third of the book. Because in the last third, Paul gets arrested on a bogus charge, and then he spends way too much time bouncing between Roman courts and Jewish courts. On the way to one trial, he gets shipwrecked, and the whole ordeal finally lands him living under house arrest in the city of Rome, where he dies without ever being granted his freedom. Acts ends just like Arrested Development. It just suddenly gets canceled right in between seasons without all the threads getting tied together. And we're left going, I've invested hours in these characters. Come on, Luke, give me a proper ending here, man. Unhindered. Are you kidding? I mean, they took off the handcuffs, but the de facto leader of the Christian church lives with his parole officer. He's not even allowed to walk out the front door. He's been obsessed over getting the gospel to Rome through all the major movements and climactic scenes of the story. And now that he's finally there, he's staying in a dingy Airbnb that he can't see beyond the four walls of. And the passage that immediately precedes this verse, the context we're given, is that he finally is able to gather all of the Jews within the city of Rome. They come to meet him in the house, and he preaches the sermon that's gone so well on every other stop on the revival tour and it falls flat. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave. That's the response Paul got in Rome. Not exactly an altar call moment. Oh, and the few Christians that are meeting in secret tiny house churches throughout the city are being actively hunted down and martyred by Emperor Nero, who's got it out for the early church. I mean, come on, guys. We had a great start, but is it more honest just to admit that our best days are behind us at this point. So Acts may start with tongues of fire, but it ends as a Shakespearean tragedy or maybe a black comedy, but unhindered, it's definitely not that. In the original language, the English unhindered is the Greek akolaitos, which most directly means freely. A pretty ironic word to describe a prisoner. And so today I want to offer you an entire sermon on just a single word. I. Howard Marshall writes in his commentary on Acts, all the emphasis lies on that last phrase. And so he, a New Testament scholar, claims that the entire book of Acts is just a 28 chapter setup for understanding a single word, unhindered. That Luke, the author of Acts, is trying to baptize our imaginations. He's trying to immerse us in the story of resurrection. Uh, to not, not just as like a one-time magic trick that God pulled off, but as the new pattern for the way God gets his work done. And so as a church living under house arrest, because, I mean, house arrest, quarantine-induced isolation, what is the difference really? Experientially, this is where we find ourselves. And sure, I mean, we are beginning to see some light at the end of the tunnel, right? I mean, as the state of things inch back toward normalcy, we as a church are increasingly beginning to regather, and that in so many ways breathes life back into this community. And in other ways, it kind of knocks the wind out of us. Because as we regather, we also survey the damage. The people that are gone now that were with us before The feeling that some will carry that they're a stranger and a people that used to feel like a family. And this whole new building thing was really, really exciting when it was an idea, but now I'm coming back together, and what if it doesn't feel like it used to feel? And there's new staff around that I've only ever known as a face on a screen as I sat on my couch at home, and our fearless leader, John Mark, he's in the midst of a long goodbye. 
And so as we regather as a church, the gap between what I expected and what I was planning and what actually is will be exposed. And Paul had plans too. In Romans 15, we read this. Since I've been longing for many years to visit you, he's talking to the Romans, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. So Paul was planning on getting to Rome via Barcelona where he was going to have bruschetta on the beach and then pop over to Rome to see the sights. And instead, he got there caged as a prisoner in transport. And then he saw Rome, but never beyond the four walls of the house that he was imprisoned in. He made it exactly where he was planning to go, but make no mistake about it, this was not the plan. And so there he sits under house arrest with a mixture of real resurrection hope and honest human grief alive within him at the same time. And the biblical invitation to people like Paul at a time like that, and to people like us at a time like this, isn't perseverance or stamina or grit or wanting it bad enough or fighting this thing. It's open your eyes. Right now, in the midst of these constraints, Jesus and his kingdom are unhindered. We are participants in a kingdom that advances freely against every force in this world, and the most powerful moments are always preceded by the blackest darkness.